We are still in our journey with Elijah and Elisha, if you remember last week. And today is part 7b, winning the battle with God on your side, part 7b. And we already started a little bit, touched the topic last week about confrontation which Elijah and his disciple Elisha faced, but mostly Elisha faced. And I would tell you something, there is a secret, without confrontation you would not grow. It is painful but it is necessary for us to become more mature, more maybe in a good sense resistant to the evil one, to get that experience. But confrontation or disagreement sometimes God uses, as we've just talked today, breakage of the rules. <laughs> when people sneak into the packages, blesses other people. Same way sometimes we get those blessings from confrontations and resistance. And in the case of Elisha, when he traveled with Elijah, and because of his loyalty, he was able to be transformed, but not without resistance. He met several times resistance from local so-called sons of prophets. And I told you that it's not necessarily the godly prophets. It were people who got supernatural knowledge, but they served to themselves, or ultimately they served to the evil one. And we will talk today a little bit more about that spirit. As you probably noticed, I'm a little bit advanced in the spiritual area, especially in the area of confronting those fallen angels or spirits. And I'll show you a little bit more in the Bible stories how it resisted to godly men and women and what was the purpose of that resistance from the evil side. You will see that. Just to understand what divination is, because the main enemy for Elisha on his travel to transformation. Again, I want to remind you that the journey which Elisha had done with Elijah was a journey of his transformation or his spiritual growth and preparation for his mission. He became one of the greatest prophets in the human history later and in Israel history particularly. And before he became a great prophet, he has been trained with those cases of resistance. And the main enemy on that journey was spirit of divination, which dwelt inside of people who resisted. What is divination definition? Divination comes from Latin word divinare to foresee, to be inspired by a God, not by a God of Israel, not by Almighty God, but by certain spiritual entity. You probably know that word Elohim means gods, not God of gods, not Lord of lords, but it could be angels, it could be even people who are in authority, like judges, for example, policemen. We also call them Elohim. And it is related to divinus, divine. It is an attempt to gain insight into a question or situation by way of an occultic standardized process or ritual. And just for your information, very often different objects have been used during those rituals to get supernatural knowledge. Every king in ancient history has had a diviner or someone who has been engaged into occultic practices in order to get understanding or supernatural knowledge about certain events. For example, when kings entered into the war, they always inquired information from those diviners. It is used in various forms throughout history. Diviners are certain their interpretations of how a one who seeks should proceed by reading signs, events, or omens or through alleged contact with a supernatural agency. There are false prophets and there are people who get this supernatural knowledge by those signs or events which are standardized. For example, in the place where I came from, there are people, if you know gypsies, you know who gypsies are. There are Christian gypsies. I've met uh, gypsies in different denominations. For example, in Finland, there is a big group of gypsies who are Pentecostals, very godly people, but they are gypsies who practice this divination. And I've had a case when once one lady came to me and started approaching me with, with this diviner's practice, and I said, let me tell you what's going to happen with you for that practice. So I broke this angel, this uh, attack, this attempt, and she repented at the end. 
I said, you do that at the expense of your children. Do you have children? Yes, I do. So you do that at the expense of your children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren who will be cursed by your practices, by your activities. She tried to make some money, giving me an insight about my future. And I said, I can tell you about your future and future of your posterity. <laughs> she had been shocked and started crying and said that she has been forced by her family to do that. So our main story is taken from second book of Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 through 25. We will take part of this story. It is about transfer of the divine spirit. As I said, it was a road of transformation for Elisha and also the road of gaining that spirit, divine spirit from the Lord of Lords. But on that road, he met several times resistance or attempts to spoil him by the occultic practices of people who were diviners and scripture calls them sons of the prophets but scripture doesn't tell them that they were sons of the prophets of the lord we should understand that as i said to you there were several stops they started their journey from gilgal then they came to Bethel, then they came to jericho and finally they came to the jordan and crossed the jordan and promised land had been laying behind the Jordan. So they reached the Jordan only when they faced those several stops and several attempts of opposing to the journey. And first one, Bethel. In the history there are two towns uh, known as Bethel, but we talk about specific one which is in Simeon or Shimon tribal territory taken from first book of Samuel chapter 30 verse 27. The other is the town that would fall within the borders of Benjamin. That Bethel was named so by Jacob, you know this story, after he sees his famous vision in which a ladder reaches into the heavens. And you remember that angels went up and down, up and down. So it was very important uh, vision for him. Probably God wanted to uh, give him an insight about his connection with the Lord of Lords to support him on his journey of transformation too. And he called that a house of El. El from Hebrew can be translated as those strong ones, powerful ones, powerful enough to transform and to change anything and everything. By the way, tornadoes are connected with that too. So storms, whirlwind, by the way, Elijah had been taken in whirlwind. So sometimes whirlwind takes righteous to God, sometimes a whirlwind comes down to unrighteous, to judge and to discipline people. And I hope that people who are suffering, you know how many people perish even now during those tornadoes, that they will get right lesson and they will repent and they will confess their sins because our unrighteousness causes land around us to suffer. All nature and land depends on our ways. If we keep our ways along the right path, nature around us is in the connection with us getting better. When we choose our own ways, corrupted ways, we spoil nature around us. We spoil it by human ways and by supernatural ways. So evil grows around us when we go by our own corrupted ways. The word bet, a little bit understand more what means uh, betel. The word bet comes from the meaning house. It's very common in the Bible. Bet is also the name of the second letter in Hebrew alphabet. As such, it is the first letter of the Bible. Do you know that bet is the first letter of the Bible? When you open the Bible and read in the beginning, in Hebrew it is the word breishit, which starts with the letter bet, meaning in the beginning. The fundamental meaning of the word bet or bed appears to be a kind of enclosure specifically for keeping, safe keeping or containing. So it is a sense of God's support and God's security in that letter alone. Betel, when translating names that contain segment El, as I said already, Elohim, judges or those powerful ones. And many times when we read in English Bible God, it means Elohim. Another step was Jericho. Jericho comes from the noun Yara or Yareh, meaning moon as time indicator, month. The etymology of this word is with the verb Arach, meaning to wander. So Jericho itself translates as the city of the moon. You know that there are certain religions even today tightly connected with the moon. 
which is not good. There is a goddess of the moon. In some religious so-called mother or queen of the heaven, it is goddess of the moon. It is Babylonian. Her Babylonian name is Ishtar. It is a goddess of fertility and her symbol is a moon. So in every religion, if you see a moon as a symbol, it means that there is connection with Ishtar. Christians, uh, Western Christians call it Easter. So every time when time will come and you will celebrate Easter, remember that God hates that name. This name is an abomination. I don't know how many times I can tell you that. <laughs> he hates that name. It's like Hitler to God. Maybe even more worse. Also, Jericho called the city of the palms, Deuteronomy 24 and Chronicles 28. And apparently its district was abounding in palms, palms, rose gardens and balsam. So it was beautiful piece of the beautiful land. But this land was filled with evil, corrupted people who choose their ways, their own ways. That is why God eventually wiped this city away just by the blowing and marching around. You remember that story. And Jordan, of course, Jordan, sorry, Jordan means uh, to sink, to be prostrated and to come down. So for Elisha, he basically gave up his humanness when he came to the point of Jordan. He has been challenged so many times and by his obedience, by his loyalty, he got this revelation about his mission. You know, very interesting, before we stepping to the ground of our mission, God will give us a revelation about what will be on the territory which he prepared for us as a field of the mission. He never, yes, you can tell me some cases I go for a mission, but I didn't get any revelation. It is because you choose the mission field, not in accordance with God's lead. If you are in tune with God's lead, he would always provide you with revelation as a matter of support, as a matter of guidance, and as a matter of protection. Sometimes people force you to go for a mission and you obey those people's push without inquiring that from God. I'm not saying that every time when people push you for a mission, it's, it is not from God. Sometimes it is from God, but not always. We have to be wise. We have to be led by the spirit of the living God and not just forced and kicked by humans because it is his mission it is his field it's funny Elohim almighty God can be translated as a field I always thought it is about provision but it is not only about provision it is a mission field as well as a field of provision so when we are on a mission at the same time when we serve to God God feeds us now, we see this order of things on their journey to Jordan when Elisha faced that opposition. We already read that last week, but just to repeat to understand what to do when the spirit of divination is active in our life. Second book of Kings, chapter 2, verses 3, 5, and 7. Verse 3, now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know it is about knowledge? It is about something which is not happened yet, but they are ready to give you the knowledge. And as a matter of the knowledge, they are ready to entice, to corrupt your way. So not always when people come to you and tell you something, what's going to happen in the future, those people had been sent by God. No, sometimes they had been sent by Satan, by the evil one, with that spirit of divination in them to tell you, Partly the truth about your future in order to distract your way, to corrupt your way and to lead you astray from your mission field. We have to be very wise, very wise. So they said, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Shut your mouth. He never allowed the spirit of divination to direct him. Even it was partly true. Next case was in verse 5. And please note also in every city they were local sons of the prophets. In every stage of our growth there is resistance equal to our level of spirituality. As much close as they've been to the promised land, 
the level of resistance was equal. Why? Because God trained Elisha. He raised him up in his maturity and his spirituality. Verse 5. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho, they were different prophets, came to Elisha and said to him, please note, they came again to Elisha, not to Elijah, to Elisha. It was object lesson for Elisha to grow. And said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. And verse 7. Opposition grew up. Now 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them, not him, them. So what, what was changed on that picture? Instead of him became them together. Exactly. When we are together, scripture says to us that when we are together, we are like a fortress. We are very strong formation. And they, they couldn't even come now to them. They stood at the distance, but facing, still watching over them, watching over them. While the two of them stood by the Jordan, the last obstacle was to cross the Jordan, right? And Jordan also can be translated as to be prostrated. Who was prostrated on the tree of crucifixion? Jesus, not Christ. Jesus. In the Salvation Army, sometimes when we do not know the name of a person, we say, Major, Major, Captain. Very bad practice. God never uses that. He knows us by the name. So Christ is like a colonel, like a major. It's his title. But his name is Jesus. There is only option for us to be saved by the name, not by the title. So when you pray in Christ's name, never pray in Christ's name. Never pray in his name. I've heard in this church, in his name. Who is he? Who is Christ? Scripture teaches us there are many false Christs who claim that they are Christ. Jesus. Amen. Yeshua. Amen. By this name, we can be saved. Everybody who will call upon this name will be saved. All other names will vanish. All other names are humans. Humans. There are many religions where, or several religions at least, where people came and they claimed that they were sons of the highest or sons of the stars or Christ. But they all perished. They are gone. They are dust of the earth now. Yes. Uh, the matter, the, the purpose of our journey is to grow and also when we are together we are able to endure. This is another very important term about this lesson for us. To get this endurance, to be able to withstand any opposition. And very interesting that from Greek to endure comes from the root word meno which means to sojourn, not to depart. That is why Jesus said to someone, take your stinky, dirty rag with you and do not depart from me. Literally what he said to him, take your dirty rag and walk around me. That's what he, uh, he literally meant when he said to this man. Do you remember when he healed paralyzed? When he restored paralyzed, he said, walk around me and keep distance short. Do not depart too far. Why? Because if you will depart too far, your stinky rag will eat you with, with that bad memory. But why he said to him, take this rag with you? Because it will always remind him who he was and who he became. It will always remind him the transformation process. It will humble him. We all, in some sense, have this rag. And we always try to get rid of this rag. And do not show it to anyone. But just, just plug your imagination. He's supposed to come back to his family, to his home, right? So he knocks the door. They open the door. And here he, here he is with his stinky rag. And first question, oh, we're so happy to see you, but why did you bring this stinky stuff with you into our house? And he would tell, because, you know, someone who healed me said to me, have it with you. 
So they will use any excuse and any reason to cut him from that stinky rabbit. We see another example of resistance and how spirit of divination is acting in, in the lives of those who are commissioned to, on a mission field. It states Paul and Silas imprisoned. As a result of this opposition, they, they have been imprisoned by then miraculously released, as you know. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 24, we read, Now it happened as we went to prayer, Paul and Silas, they went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us. Word possess is very interesting. It possess. You know what possess? You possess your bag. You are willing to do with your bag whatever you want. You can, you know, load it, you can throw it, you can give it to someone else. So you, you have it as your possession. This word doesn't mean that this girl has been fully possessed, 100%. No. The word in Greek, which means possess, it means certain degree. But God always leaves inside of us freedom of choice. So if we are possessed by the evil spirit, it doesn't mean that we have an excuse. We don't. Because God always leaves to us freedom of making choice. So she has been possessed with the spirit of divination. She met us, or Paul and Silas and people who were with him, who brought, and this girl brought her master's much profit by fortune telling. Do you know how many people who possessed by the spirit of divination are in casinos? Hundreds and hundreds. They are led by the spirit with expectation. The spirit leads them to casino in order to provide them with an answer to gain some money. Possession by the spirit of divination is profitable to us humans. But at the expense of our lives in eternity and, and curses which will fall upon our posterity. In business, people who are possessed by the spirit of divination, sometimes they are very successful in business areas. They can tell you far ahead about certain events, about certain conclusions, about certain results in a commercial activities which brings additional income. So income is connected. In this world, income very often connected with existence of that spirit in, inside of the organization. Spirit of divination uh, dwells inside of churches too. We have to be very careful. We should check and be uh, very attentive to people when they tell us something what's going to happen in the future. Or sometimes they tell us about what was happened in the past too, when we are in secluded rooms. So she brought her master's much profit by fortune telling, verse 17, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. I'm moving to this section to make you happy. <laughs> these people, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. She has been first salvationist. <laughs> she brought the message of salvation. To other people, you laughing, you laughing, you think that it is bad. Yes, it is. But God is so great. Do you remember I told you? When people rip apart packages with socks, eventually it blesses other people. Doesn't matter how bad this girl was. The matter is for other people to have open ears about her message. Doesn't matter how bad person is who comes to us and tells to us about the way of salvation. If we have open ears, it can transform and change our lives. This person who brought to us message, if he is corrupted and perverted, it is his business. He is responsible for himself, but what he proclaims can change and transform our lives. So she said her message was right, but the purpose was wrong. Intention was 
evil. Basically, she was like, like this ripped apart package of socks. <laughs> you can pull one by one those socks and use them. <laughs> or you can say, oh, who ripped apart this package? Must be the wrong person, bad person. Verse 18. And this she did for many days. Can you imagine? For many days she proclaimed the message. These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. God gave to those people in this town time to repent through that evil girl. By the way, people in this town, they knew that she, you know, what she tells is true. She has been proved as someone who can tell something what is hidden. But what the evil one wanted to do with that, at the same time, he wanted to uncover Paul and Silas. They came as spies to perverted city. And she uncovered their real position and their real place in the mission field. But Paul, greatly annoyed because of that, turned and said to the spirit, please note, he didn't tell to a girl. Sometimes you talk with people, but sometimes people come to you and you do not talk with people. You talk with the spirit who in them. You basically talk with an angel. You have to have open eyes with whom you talk. If you talk, if you think you always talk with people, you are wrong. There are people on the street, they can come and talk to you and you really will talk with the spirit. You have to have gift of discernment. Ask God to give you discernment. So he recognized Paul. Why he recognized that? Because he was an apostle. Do you remember I told you God never sends you to a mission field without revelation? Paul got this revelation who was inside of this girl and he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Once I started praying for a stewardess, she worked all her life as a stewardess, very nice, gentle woman, very kind. But when I started praying for her, she was folded like that yeah. and she couldn't straight her and her voice was changed she started talking with me with very deep male voice <laughs> and she has been terrified and she couldn't stop and after a little while her voice was changed and she told to me uh, by female voice by her voice it's not me it's not me i don't know what is going on we command to this spirit to be gone from her it took probably 15 or 20 minutes of fight and eventually, you know, she was straightened up and spirit was gone. Spirit left her. So it still happens today. Still happens today. He said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And I want to tell you something. When you come to those people who have spirits, spirit sees you. He knows you. If you are a godly person, if you sold yourself to Jesus Christ, he knows that. He doesn't need any papers. But if you pretend that you sold your life to Jesus Christ, Spirit will tell you, you are a liar. That's right. You are a liar. There, there is no play with angels. They, they recognize of who you are. Seriously. That's right. Amen. So it is very serious business. And there is another story when Spirit said, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who you are, you are nobody to me. You have no authority to command me anything. But Paul has had authority to command to this spirit. And he came out that very hour. Please note, that very hour. Not that very minute. So it took some time. It was a fight, which probably lasted one hour. People can vomit. I've seen as one girl, when uh, we started praying for her, all those chairs, they were mounted to the ground. She raised whole row. That's how powerful this spirit was. Tiny girl, she stood up and lifted up to the air several chairs. I myself and five other men, we couldn't hold one tiny girl. She was 13. 
we could not hold her. She moved us. I was sitting, on, she was uh, prostrated on the ground. I was sitting on her arm. She moved me by her arm, laying down on the ground. Moved me up to the air. That's how powerful those spirits are. And if it's not name of Jesus Christ, we are done. They will smash us in a second. But because of the name of Jesus Christ, we have authority to command them. They will obey. Amen. They will obey. Amen. That's because that's what scripture teaches us. We have authority in Jesus Christ, which is given to us to fight. Verse 19. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone. So why people sold themselves to Satan? Because of profit. There are several big hooks which Satan has. One hook is a pleasure. Another hook is a profit. Yeah. We can sell ourselves to him by those two things. There are many other things, but those are two big ones. That their hope of profit was gone. They sized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace <laughs> to the authority. So where did they drag them? To the marketplace. Please, where do we get most profit from? From the market place. Now, why authorities were connected with the marketplace? Why authorities were connected with the marketplace? Because most gain, most profit came from the marketplace to authorities. Marketplace and authorities, they are interconnected. And they brought them to the magistrates. So authorities took them and brought them to the upper level, to magistrates, and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. What does it mean, exceedingly trouble? Minimize our profit. Limit our profit. That's how they recognize those troubles or define those troubles. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans. To receive or observe. Do you know? See, I'm playing now Sons of Prophets role. Do you know that we still today in the time of a conflict between customs and rules of Jerusalem and customs and rules of Rome? Doesn't matter what church we are in, see? Even microphone is stuff. <laughs> Someone doesn't want for me to tell you that. Okay, I'll speak without microphone. I'll speak without microphone. So we have two worlds, basically, if to simplify picture in the maximum. We have world of Jerusalem with its own customs and rules, which is world of the God Most High. And we have world of Rome, which spoiled Christianity. Right? Yes. It is still spoiled by the Rome by the Roman customs and rules. And it is up to us. God purposely left those two worlds to exist for us to have freedom to make a choice, to make a choice what road we will take. So that is why they accuse. See how they accuse. They didn't tell. They minimize our profit. But the true reason was that they lost their profit, right? Instead, they brought said, and said, they teach customs. First of all, they said, they, these men being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together. Very funny. Again, same word, together, right? Elijah and Elisha, they were together. Multitude rose up together against them. There is always provocations who stir up the crowd. The crowd. Do you know this word, Ahlamon? Ahlamon? Ahlamon, it is an empty head person who led by the crowd. It comes from Greek word, Ochlas, means a crowd, a mob. Mob or mob. So part of that mob is Ahlomon, someone who is led by the mob, by the crowd, who never thinks really twice or three times before making any decision. In every event, if you will notice, there are people who provocate, they stir up the crowd, and then people are moving like a wave, wiping off everything on their road. So that's exactly what they've done in this city. And the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with roads. So when magistrates have seen this crowd, 
that crowd is against those two people, they, they represent their deep sense of mourning. That's what it means, tore off their clothes and commanded those two uh, missionaries to be beaten with roads. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks, in the shackles. So their mobility, white text says to us that fastened their feet in the stocks. Why? The main purpose of Satan was to stop those two, to stop. So feet were the main part because they limited their mobility. They cut the rest of people in this city from their messages, from their sermons, from their mission. Uh, very briefly, the signs of the times and the end and the end of the age. Matthew chapter 24. Now, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Jesus privately again, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Why I brought this story? Because this story is correlated, connected with the story which is written in the book of Acts. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to his disciples, Now, please keep in mind, he said that to them privately, privately. God doesn't tell the same message to everyone. For those people who are rebellious, God speaks in legends, in parables. For those people who are obedient and open, he speaks plainly. Because when God speaks in parables, it is a sign of his judgment. What he said to them, take heed, which means take it to your heart. Be open, be wise, that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, which means saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled by those rumors, right? For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and they will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. There is a legend in the church about rapture. It is a lie from Satan. God will pass every human being through the sorrows. Why? To separate truth from lie. Gold from the rotten, corrupted dust of the earth which still dwells in us. We are carnal. So God will divide and separate. Our God is a God of division between light and darkness. He never mingles. He never makes salad with light and darkness. He separates. He separates light from darkness. That is why sorrows are needed to Christians. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. We know what tribulation is. Tribulation, it is a torture. It is a torture. Tribulation comes from Latin word tribulum. A will. A will with huge spikes. You know what Romans have done? They let this, they pulled this uh, will with big spikes. And those spikes, they smashed and cut and killed everything what was alive on that road. That's what means tribulation. And kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Do you hear what Jesus said? You will be hated. By all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. (laughs) Will betray one another. And will hate one another. Instead of love one another. And support one another. See separation, hate and betrayal. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. That's exactly what happened with Elisha. Those false prophets deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound... Today in the church you can hear in many places that Jesus abolished what? The law. law. Can you imagine? In the house of the Lord you can hear from this from this puppet. Jesus abolished the law. He never abolished the law. He repeated twice for for stubborn and deaf people. He repeated twice, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. But 
because people still believe in that lie, lawlessness, because again of profit, pleasure, and every other hook from Satan, people will go astray from the law of the Lord, which is holy and needed for us to guide as GPS system, as a system of navigation. Law is a system of navigation for our souls to preserve us, to direct us, and to save us eventually by God's grace. Why? Because we will fail. It doesn't matter how skillfully God will navigate us, we will deviate from that because we are humans. That is why God employs grace. Grace never goes alone. Grace always accompanied by the law. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The truth is today, still today, love. You know, in churches you can hear even the message about first love. Because people, they lose first love. They lose. And it's up to us how to steer this love in us, how to keep this love alive and hot, not growing cold. It is my responsibility and your responsibility to, to secure love in us, not to grow cold. But he who endures, see, he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's what Jesus said. In many churches, I've seen so stupid things in some churches. Are you saved? Are you saved? Pastor came to people on the first row. That is why some people do not ever sit on the first row. <laughs> Are you saved? Are you saved? And I wanted to stay, stay, stood up and say to him, Are you saved? Why do you ask people? Yeah. It is not their business. He who endures to the end shall be saved. It is not my business about salvation. My business is about endurance. I have to pray about endurance. I have to do something in order to endure. I have to do something in order to keep myself in love of Christ and not grow cold. That's what, see how skilled Satan is. He deviates our focus from endurance to salvation. We should not, it is not my business. God will save me if I will endure See how skilled Satan is. There are so many books today, today about. I've been taught, if you ask Jesus, please come into my heart and live here. I am a sinner. You know, I confess that I am a sinner. I am saved. I am saved. All angels are rejoicing now in heaven. Amen. Sinners pray. Where have you seen sinners pray in the Bible? There is no sinners pray in the Bible. It is church creation. Not God's creation. So what word endures? Do you remember what word endures means? To sojourn. To be sojourner with Christ. Not to depart from Christ. So my business not to depart from Christ. That's it. God's business in his time to save me. Verse 14, last one. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. What is the gospel of God's kingdom? It is the witness. What does it mean? It means that not my will, not my rules, but his rules, his will. Doesn't matter what territory, we have different citizenship, but we should have just one citizenship. Citizenship of the kingdom of heaven or citizenship of the kingdom of God will be preached uh, the gospel of the kingdom in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come so why God postpones the end because he loves us humans that is why he wants to bring his message about his kingdom to every individual that is why he slows down with the end so he gives to us time because he loves us he gives to us again and again and again opportunity. That is why he used even that girl for many days. She went behind those two and, and proclaimed the way of salvation. Those men are the servants of the most high God who brought to us the way of salvation. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Word endured in this verse, upomeno, a persevere. Under misfortunes and trials. Misfortunes, even word, <laughs> misfortune is a pagan word, bad word. Fortuna is a pagan goddess, bad word. But it means when you have no luck, or I don't know, when you are not successful, when we are losers. 
we still should persevere. Do I like to be a loser? Absolutely not. But, <laughs> but God wants... <laughs> But God wants for me to persevere, doesn't matter if I'm a winner or I'm a loser. And trials, so what trials? Trials come from a side by the other people, other people cause. Sometimes we ourselves cause those trials to come to our lives. Sometimes it, it happens because of resistance, of the darkness. But doesn't matter, we should be, you know, people of endurance. We should to endure, to hold fast to one's faith in Jesus Christ. As we just read before, meno, root word, in reference to state or condition, it is the state of my mind. It is the state of the conditions of my heart, of my values and my lives. To remain as one. Why? Because our God is one. But not one. One, one, one. <laughs> okay, what, what's, God's, what's God's math? One plus one plus one equals one. one. one not three. Yeah. One plus one plus one equals one. One, 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 one. In Rome, in Rome, it equals three. In Jerusalem, it equals one. Different math. <laughs> to remain as one, not to become another or different. What God says, do not depart from me. Doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, doesn't matter where you stay, doesn't matter what conditions of your life you have. Stay with me, do not depart from me, and you are s safe, not saved, safe. I know I cause some, I know I cause some irritations, but it is good. It means that we are alive. When irritations happen in us, it means that we are alive. I'm not a Snickers bar to be... Even, you know, even Snickers bar is not beloved by everyone, right? Or favorite. Some people love Mars bar. <laughs> I like more Snickers. Mars for me is too sweet. That's him. Mars like caramel. I do love Mars. They're delicious. So what, what Jesus said to us, I am, I am, who is I am? God. God. Yahweh. Someone who establishes and supports my and yours existence. He supports. He is one of the most deepest and core level of who we are. We are alive until we have breath of life which he gave to us. So he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Amen. It starts with I am and finishes with Amen. I like in, in Canada people say Amen. For some reason in the U.S. they say Amen. I don't know why Amen. Why in the U.S. people say Amen in Canada? Amen. <laughs> it's so funny to me. Same English. You know? I've learned for years to say amen in the U.S. No, before I said amen, then I came to U.S. and I've learned to say amen. Now I'm in Canada, I have to relearn to say amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. But correct, correct way is not amen nor amen. Correct word is amen. <laughs> And what is interesting, again, just look at this verse. Look at this verse. Bible is amazing by its structure. It's like a beautiful, absolutely harmonized picture. What starts with I am finishes with Omen. Always. What I say to, to your spirit, I, I, what I'm saying right now to you, or I address that to your spirit, not to your mind, to your spirit. What starts with I am always finishes with Omen. Always. Nobody can stop it. Because nobody can interrupt I am. Even we are ourselves. This is security message for me and for you. Security message. What I am has started will be Omen. Which means truth. True. 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 Please note Jesus said just once Omen here. Not twice. Sometimes he says twice. Sometimes he says once. He said just once here. Just think about that. 
the secret is, if he says once, Omein, it speaks about Passover. When he speaks twice, Omein, Omein, it speaks about Passover and crucifixion. <laughs> is it crazy? Just think about that. Why he brought just once Omein here? Because he wants to tell to you and to me. Doesn't matter how strong Egypt is. Doesn't matter how strong Rome is. Roman Empire is. Doesn't matter. What I am has started will be finished with Passover. Amen. And what Passover is? Passover is the beginning. God leads us to the beginning of something what is so beautiful that we have no even ability to imagine how beautiful it is. It is absolutely free and full of many blessings. No more tears. Yesterday I was preaching at the cemetery. No more tears, no more pain, no more struggles. What Passover represents? A release from the house of bondage, from the house of slavery, from the house of stagnation, from the house of corruption. Just think about that. God gave, it just came to me. I know you are tired, but God, for some reason, God gives something at the end, what is dessert, what is called dessert. Do you know that word dessert and word stressed are the same word? Dessert and stressed. When you come back home, you just write down and read backwards. Yes, sometimes God gives to us dessert when we are stressed. (laughs) sometimes when we have dessert we get stressed (laughs) when we have too much desserts too much desserts we have to be very careful have you noticed I always keep distance but when you do not see I I shorten that distance you're pretty good at that yes okay let us pray sorry it was very interesting and I lost that uh, can I say something? Yeah. I just want to tell you that I uh, am very blessed that you are not fearful and concerned about sharing what's true. I want to tell you that, Sergey, because a lot of churches you go to and they don't really have much of a mess. It's all social, a social gospel. And I want to thank you that it's been not easy for you to stand. But thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are Praise a Lord. vessel that will stand for him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Let us pray. Last thing, it came back to me. Those children, uh, listen, 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 listen. Those children of the prophets, did they have a chance to repent when they came to Elisha? Yes, they did. They've had a chance to repent instead of trying to stop him, to sojourn, to come and go with them together. Support them and go together to the Jordan and eventually to cross the Jordan and to enter into the promised land. So even enemies, even people who were enemies of Elisha, they still got this chance to be dwellers of the promised land. But they missed that chance. They missed. Because they made a wrong choice. They have been possessed, but God still gave them freedom of choice. And they made a wrong choice. That is why they left. Yeah, it's time to finish. Yes, I understand that. (laughs) Heavenly Father, thank you that you are beyond any time. Beyond any our capabilities and abilities and talents and gifts and shortages and when we are failures when we are losers you still love us you still tell us do not depart i know what you experience i know your pain i know your bitterness i know your anger but still do not depart from me thank you that you caring about even those people who oppose us even about those people who fight against us, they give them chance as well to come and dwell at the promised land. And Father, I pray for those who hate us, who force us, who go against us. Please give them revelation about yourself. Please give them opportunity to come and be with us together. 
and to be our sojourners, to be our companions in our way to the promised land. In your precious name, Jesus, I'm praying. Amen.